1995, a film was released called The Englishman Who Went Up a Hill But Came Down a Mountain, starring Hugh Grant, a then 30-something-year-old owner of the world's floppiest hair. It probably didn't live long in people's memories. This video is not about that film, nor is it about Hugh Grant's magnificent hair. Instead, it's about another Englishman who went up a mountain, then stayed there. The Englishman in question was called Maurice Wilson, and he was born in 1898 in Bradford, a town in northern England which at the time was known as Wall City. As the name suggests, it was a thriving place made rich through the textiles industry. In fact, Wilson's family was pretty high up in that industry, owning their own textile factory. He would have reasonably expected to enjoy a comfortable, upper-middle-class existence. Unfortunately for Morris, and for lots of other people of his generation, something was going to happen which threw all of his expectations out of the window. That thing was World War I. Wilson joined the West Yorkshire Regiment, a regional regiment, and it consisted of some of the so-called Bradford Pals Battalions. The Pals Battalions were basically collections of people who maybe were from the same area, did the same job, they could all reasonably expect to know each other, and it kind of sounds like a good idea, you know, go to war with your mates, no awkward silences at mealtimes. World War One being what it was though, it actually just turned into a really good way of deleting entire communities of young men in one go. All that being said, we can imagine that Morris probably didn't have huge amounts of fun, but he did at least perform adequately and won a military cross for conspicuous bravery. Unfortunately for Morris, just a few months later, and just prior to the end of the war, he was seriously injured and returned home to the UK to convalesce. Despite this time in the hospital, Morris was left with wounds which never really healed and left him in chronic pain for the rest of his life. And as with so many others, these visible wounds were almost certainly accompanied by invisible ones that were equally as lifelong and equally as debilitating. As a result, Wilson's convalescence was a long one, up to a couple of years, and by the time he was able to rejoin society, the 1920s had started, and that society had changed beyond all recognition. We tend to think of the 1920s as the Roaring Twenties, a somewhat hedonistic period where people wanted to throw off the misery of the previous decade, for understandable reasons. While this has a grain of truth, it's a little bit more complicated than that. It was a very fluid time, both politically and socially. An important concept is the lost generation, people who had gone through World War I and the Spanish flu pandemic to become somewhat lost and directionless. There was also a more literal meaning, demographically speaking. As an example, in France, if you were a male of 20 years age in 1914, you were one of 72% of your peers who'd made it that far. Five years later, there'd be only 48% of that cohort still alive. Alongside these, there were many people, Maurice Wilson probably included, who had survived but had been irrevocably changed by the war, and they'd collectively started to move past the old lies and promises of the authorities. So, you can understand why the social fluidity emerged, Amongst other things, there were calls for women's rights, a push for improved education, and general betterment of living conditions, and a call to the end of the colonial mindset. Geopolitically, the decade began to see the focus of power and money start to definitively move across the Atlantic from Europe, with the United States consolidating its rise to the predominant world power. Nonetheless, most of the European colonial powers still wielded it to some degree, and in particular maintained their entitled mindset. Outside of the halls of power and tradition, though, the 1920s saw this rebelling against social norms lead to a period of unusual liberality. And unfortunately, the world doesn't like people being too happy or progressive for too long, and, spoiler alert, by the time the 20s ended, the dark shadows of the 1930s and onwards were already starting to draw together. It was into this society that Wilson found himself thrust after he'd, kind of, recovered. He probably had lots of questions, but what's important is to remember is that in the 1920s, previous ideas of self-sacrifice, bringing about greatness and glory for the mother country, were pretty frowned upon. And so Wilson, like so many others, would have to derive some meaning for himself. Luckily for Wilson, his family being well off meant that he had the means to travel, and so he made his way across the world, starting businesses and accumulating money with some success. However, happiness seemed to elude him. His physical injuries still continued to trouble him, and in 1924 he was in Germany recovering from a relapse when he learnt of the disappearance of George Mallory and Sandy Irvin in their attempt at Everest. Although the seed was planted around this point, he didn't and probably couldn't act on it immediately. However, he recovered and continued his itinerant lifestyle, searching for meaning and good health. 
In 1932, he seemed to find it. He met a stranger in Mayfair in London, a place where, in truth, most people are relatively strange, and he said he learned of the panacea, 35 days of fasting and prayer. He undertook this and declared himself fully recovered. For some reason, Wilson never gave any details about this mysterious stranger, and they just seemed to fade away into the background. That notwithstanding, a now rejuvenated Wilson turned his mind back to his search for meaning, and that meaning he would find in climbing Everest. He became convinced that his regime of prayer and fasting would allow him to conquer the mountain where all before had failed. known as alpinism. Its so-called silver and golden ages focused, as the name suggests, on Europe, but soon its net started to be cast wider. It was always a rich person's game though, particularly when those peaks were further away than Europe. It had something of a resurgence in popularity post-World War I, particularly in Himalayan mountaineering, as it became some kind of national test of character. The standout expeditions of the 1920s were easily George Mallory's, Apparently the first person to answer the question, why climb it, with the famous mountaineering answer, because it's there. As mentioned before, Mallory's and Irving's 1924 disappearance captivated Wilson, and it also shows the innate romance of mountaineering, in as much as debate still goes on as to whether they actually reach the summit or not. It's clear that this romance, though, and the chance to prove oneself, motivated someone like Boris Wilson very heavily. It's probably worthwhile now to have a step back and look at the broader picture of the world at the time. Mountaineering, particularly in Nepal, is still often criticised as having a kind of colonial mindset to this day, with Westerners taking advantage of local communities for their own adventures. While that may have an element of truth to this day, it was definitely true back in the colonial days. Everest is a good example of this. It's named after the irascible and unpleasant George Everest, who was a Surveyor General of India in the 1830s and 40s, despite him not having anything really to do with it and never visiting the mountain. It was measured and named by an employee named Radhanath Sikdar, who slipped out of the official story when he fell out of favour for some dangerously liberal ideas, which is pretty much par for the course for the British Empire. Speaking of the Empire, in 1920 it covered 35.5 million square kilometres, or 24% of the Earth's total land area. By this point it was becoming clear that empires like this were unsustainable, politically, economically and morally, and so dominions were getting more power and autonomy, although let's be clear, this basically meant that majority white countries got it like Australia, Canada and New Zealand. India did not get any autonomy. In fact, the general approach to India in British political thinkings ranged from the so-called positive comments about India and self-determination which were always couched in ways that were painfully patronising. Essentially, the idea was that Indians would get self-determination at some point, but they'd probably screw it up. And then you got things like Winston Churchill's famous aphorism about the Indians, which were a beastly people with a beastly religion. So there is that. Despite his apologists now, Churchill was even considered by others in the Conservative Party to be a bit more racist than they were comfortable with. Yeah, the Conservative Party. Just let that sink in for a second. As for Nepal specifically, I think most people at the time, and probably now, would have lumped it in with the overall British Empire, but technically it was not. There had been a short war in the early 19th century, when it became a protectorate with a few annexed areas, but it technically remained independent. This didn't stop the British Empire doing what the British Empire did though. The fact that at this point they were surreptitiously recruiting Gurkhas to fight in their armies, completely against a treaty between the two countries, just shows a British colonial mindset at its clearest. It was, wherever we are, the country is ours, the people are ours, and we'll do what we want. This is important for our story because Maurice Wilson was a product of this society, so it gives us some understanding of his basic hubris in thinking that the world would shape itself around his desire to climb Everest. He was a British man in what was, at the time, a British man's world. Nonetheless, he still had some pretty big obstacles to get over before he could conquer Everest. Chief among these, and this is being charitable, was Wilson's complete lack of preparation and possible stupidity. 
His thought process must have been, okay, I'm going to climb Everest. I need to get there, and then I need to climb it. First challenge, I'm going to fly there, in my own plane. The problem was, he couldn't fly, but he didn't think that would be insurmountable. He did manage to get his license, somehow, despite being an epically poor student, and then he bought a plane, which he called Everest. E-V-E-R space W-R-E-S-T. Don't ask me why. As an aside, for those unfamiliar with planes at this period, they were still basically kites with delusions of grandeur, and the construction methods were still that, basically, if you took a good run up, you could probably run completely through one. Anyway, to Morris's mind, one challenge down, feeling pretty good. Next, how shall I prepare for the mountaineering? So, he did this by making no attempt to learn climbing techniques or by equipment. He apparently did climb Snowdon, which is about 12% the height of Everest, and which people climb in their flip-flops. Probably not the best preparation, but he seemed pretty happy with himself. At this point, he presumably thought Everest was just a big hill and just everyone was exaggerating. Some people thought that he may have been fooled by overly optimistic and understated reports from Everest, but, you know, this was the 1930s. Photographs existed. Film existed. At this point, though, it should be noted that Wilson didn't plan to climb Everest entirely. The plan was to gently crash his plane somewhere in the upper elevations and then sneak up to the top. Perhaps tellingly, though, he seemed to have no obvious idea as to how he would then make it back down. Maybe prayer and fasting allows you to fly? And so, entirely unprepared, he set off in April 1933, and immediately crashed. He was uninjured, but he drew the attention of authorities in the shape of the Air Ministry, who told him to stop being stupid and that he couldn't go. He ignored them, and set off anyway three weeks later. I imagine him flipping the bird to the angry government representatives at the airfield as he flew off. However, the British government then tried to stop him at every turn by leaning on foreign governments to not allow overflight permission, and blocking all the landing fields they could in the Middle East. Eventually, he landed in Bahrain, and when met with government officials, who clearly had not had a chance to learn from previous interactions with Wilson, he put on his best, trust me, face, and promised to refuel and go straight back home. They agreed to this, and after preparing, he took to the air, and immediately headed east. Again laughing and making faces at the officials. Amazingly, he managed to make it to India, just. He landed in Gwadar, then the most westerly airfield in India, now in Pakistan which he would have been happy about as it was the extreme limit of his range. Here, he again refuelled, presumably pulling the same trick, and carried on to Lal Balu in northern India. So he did get where he was going, despite the journey being made in what was basically a death trap controlled by an idiot. At this point though, the colonial authorities had completely lost any chill that they had once had, and they impounded his plane, told him they were keeping an eye on him to make sure he didn't do anything stupid. He made his way to Darjeeling and spent the winter kicking his heels, and during this time he happened to meet some Sherpas, who were named Tirang, Rinzing and Sering. Christ knows why, but they were willing to take him to Nepal, and so, on the 21st of March 1934, he and his companions got the hell out of Dodge in the dead of night. Three weeks later, they reached Rongbok Monastery, where Wilson was welcomed and allowed to even to take some gear. Importantly though, Rongbok Monastery has perfect views of Everest, and Wilson clearly must have seen the scale of the thing. Two days later, and presumably still thinking Everest was entirely overhyped despite being able to see it, he set off alone to conquer Everest. And this is where it gets really stupid. In his first attempt, he spent five days getting lost stamping up and down the Rombok Glacier, either not knowing how to use his borrowed equipment or deciding it was just really not required. He then spent four days getting back down in tremendous pain from his war wounds and new exciting ankle injuries blaming the weather. He then spent time recovering, presumably with some really serious fasting and praying. His second attempt, which started on the 12th of May 1934, he set off with two Sherpas, Tewad and Rinsing, and they were presumably the only reason he managed to get to just below the North Col. Somewhat amazingly, the North Col is just below 7,000 metres, 7 kilometres up. After four days of hardly going anywhere, they reached an ice wall that defeated them. The Sherpas told him that to go on was suicide, but again, as you might expect from Wilson, he basically just flipped them the bird. On the 31st of May, he set off again, on his own, with the last entry in his diary reading, off again, gorgeous day. For some time at least, that was the last the world had heard of Morris Wilson. <laughs> 
The final chapter just took another year. His body was found in 1935 at the base of the North Col, surrounded by the remains of his tent and a bag nearby with his belongings in it. It seemed pretty clear that he died of either exposure or starvation, and given his preparation of fasting, that might not be a bad shout. However, as mentioned before, the romance of mountaineering, there is some kind of mystery. Well, not really. In a 2003 interview with Thomas Noy, a Tibetan climber Gombu stated that on an attempt in 1960, he had been part of a team that had found the remains of an old tent at 8,500 metres, which would have been higher than any other previous expeditions. And so, for a very brief period of time, around about three seconds, people wonder if Morris Wilson could have made the attempt and died on the way down. He didn't. He never even got over the North Col, but it's amazing he got there. Even when people had let go of this slightly stupid notion that Wilson could actually have scaled Everest, they still didn't want to let go of this mystery around these so-called remains, and the idea circled that they could have been from a secret Soviet expedition in 1952, but even that is legend rather than anything confirmed. I think when it comes to whether certain people have scaled Everest or not, the final word goes with Sir Edmund Hillary, who said, If you climb a mountain for the first time and die on the descent, is it really a complete first ascent of the mountain? I'm rather inclined to think, personally, that maybe it's quite important the getting down, and the complete climb of a mountain is reaching the summit and getting safely to the bottom again. About the story of Maurice Wilson. Well, it seems to be a little bit like a kind of monomyth, or the hero's journey. So, there's a call to adventure, he's changed from the norm by the war, there's a road of trials, or in this case a flight of trials. There's a discovery of allies and a boon being given, so being welcomed in wrong book and given equipment even though he didn't use it. And the Sherpa's helping out, I still don't know why. But then reality kicks in, and the triumphant return certainly does not happen. So was Wilson just an idiot? Well, maybe a little, although I may be being a bit harsh. He's definitely a result of his environment, though. As a member of the Lost Generation, he was looking for meaning in a world which had been turned upside down by the First World War. And as a result, as mentioned, the 1920s were a time of a breaking of norms in politics, social conventions, etc. But, in this world where colonialism and its paternalistic mores were still alive and kicking, social changes may have benefited Westerners, but colonialism was still not a dirty word for most people. And so he would have set off with presumably the complete conviction that he both could and would basically do what he wanted, and he had the money and chances to do that. Along with these deeply ingrained ideas about white British supremacy. Another common trait was a love of eccentricity, something which remains strong in the British psyche to this day. The English utilitarian thinker John Stuart Mill wrote that the amount of eccentricity in a society has generally been proportional to the amount of genius, mental vigour and moral courage which it contained, and he mourned a lack of eccentricity as the chief danger of the time. The British fascination with eccentricity can be very self-defeating though, it overly celebrates some people who may have actual mental issues, particularly if they're upper class. It is a well-known concept that upper class people are eccentric. If you're lower class or poor, you're just mad. Obviously that's an unacceptable notion, but when you double down with it being wrapped as something to be accepted, and if promoted in certain circumstances, it can be something really dangerous. In this case, Wilson only paid with his own life, but it could easily have involved other people. Finally though, we're in an age of seeing cues on Everest, and the idea is definitely there that it's just somewhere you could run back up if you left your lunch at the top. At the final calculation though, prayer and fasting are suboptimal for preparing to climb what was, and remains, a really, really big hill. Mountain where it snows, shooting stars. I can see me ten galaxies, light years apart. There's a hole inside the sun, I put it there with my thumb. I've got complete control of everything and everyone, cause I'm alone here. I'm stoned at 9am and I'm drunk by the afternoon.